Good evening. Good evening. Great. This looks so great. I'm just so glad everybody's here. My name's Chuck Swanson. I'm the director of, of Hancher. And first of all, I just can't believe that we're just a few days away from the preview performances of Christopher Wilden's Nutcracker for the Joffrey Ballet. We have been waiting for this for a long, long time. Hancher and the University of Iowa are very proud to be producing sponsor of this production and to give our community a chance to see this new work on our new stage before its official premiere in Chicago. So I want to give you a little bit of history of Hancher and the University of Iowa and the Joffrey. As many of you know, Hancher's relationship with the Joffrey Ballet is both longstanding and robust. Highlights over the years include extended Iowa dance residencies in the early 1980s, Hancher's very first commission, and we've now commissioned over 100 pieces of new work, was back in 1986, titled Heart of the Matter, choreographed by James Kadelka. Then the commissioning and world premiere of the first rock ballet ever, called Billboards in 1993, featuring music by Prince, who everybody knows Prince, or knew Prince. Then the 30th anniversary River to River tour in 2007, that saw the Joffrey perform outdoors in five Iowa communities for more than 35,000 people as a gift to the state. And then, of course, the commissioning and world premiere of Robert Joffrey's Nutcracker, which opened on the original Hancher stage almost 29 years ago to the very day. We presented runs of Robert Joffrey's Nutcracker six times, the last time being in 2004, and over 400 young people from Iowa have danced from around our community, and they were part of this magical production. And so we're proud that this, con this tradition continues. And I know we have some dancers here tonight, I know I see one anyway, who will be in this new Nutcracker. We can't wait to see this happen on the stage. So I hope all of you will be joining us for one of these five performances of the Nutcracker here at Hancher. The first preview performance is this Thursday night, and performances continue through Sunday afternoon before the Joffrey returns to, Ch to Chicago for a month-long run at the Auditorium Theater. This is a huge undertaking, and once again, I want to share the pride that Hancher and the University of Iowa take in having to make this happen. We are grateful to our donors, and as a university, this is a perfect example of bringing together some of the most creative minds in the world today and helping with the birth of something very unique and very special. I don't think it gets any better than that. So now a quick introduction of our panelists. First of all, Ashley Weeder. Ashley is the artistic director of the Joffrey Ballet. He was a member of the company and danced in the Nutcracker on the Hancher stage in 1987. Next, April Daly. April Daly has been with the Joffrey since 2003 and was a part of our River to River tour. And I'll never forget seeing her on that stage. In 2009, Dance Magazine declared her on the rise. And then we have Christopher Wilden, who I just I'm just so excited to know that he's here at Hancher Auditorium in the University of Iowa for just about two weeks. Chris, that is just so cool. That's so exciting. One of the most in-demand choreographers working today, and he was winner of the 2015 Tony Award for the best choreographer for an American in Paris. And Julian Crouch, who I've gotten to know, and he's just such a gentleman, such a sweetheart. Julian is a Tony-nominated set and costume designer whose work included Hedgewig and the Angry Inch and Shock-Headed Peter. And then the panelist will be moderated by Rebecca Ritzel, who recently joined the Minneapolis Star Tribune staff as a performing arts critic and reporter. Prior to arriving in Minneapolis, she spent eight years as a freelance dance critic for the Washington Post. 
The Creative Matter Lecture Series is helping to co-sponsor tonight's event with Hancher, and we thank them for their support. With that, please help me in joy joining, uh, welcome me in joining the panel. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. I want to start by saying that my career this year has, um, in a way, it's paralleled Christopher Weldon's. I'm, this is going to be my third Christopher Weldon full-length story ballet this year. I had the privilege in Washington of the last time we talked of writing about The Winter's Tale, which was his joint commission for uh, the National Ballet of Canada and the Royal Ballet. And then we just, I just got to see his Cinderella, which was a joint commission between Dutch National and uh, the San Francisco Ballet, which was wonderful, and also included Julian's work, correct? Um, and now we're here, both here in the Midwest. I'm at the Star Tribune, and um, Christopher's here is sort of, and everyone being here is testimony to the fact that great art can happen here, not just at the Kennedy Center and at uh, other you know, halls around the world. So um, I wanted to see if we could start by talking about how it is that Christopher and the rest of the team have decided what to choose to include in this Nutcracker, what were the sacred things that they really wanted to keep and what were the things that they had to change? If any of you saw um, Alistair McCulley's review of Two Nutcrackers over the weekend, he noted that one of the major differences um, between Nutcrackers is that in some, some companies spell the sugar plum fairy as one word <laughs> and some people spell sugar plum as two. And this is being upheld by the New York Times as a major distinction between nutcrackers. <laughs> what the folks at this table have done here is do away, is done away with the sugar plum fairy altogether. So with, I, does that give you enough <laughs> to go in there? Free. Sorry. It's a sugar free nutcracker. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not, it it's is not sugar a free. It's actually a little, yeah. Um, well, we, we haven't taken away Christmas, so that's a good start. Um, I, I, think, um, I think often um, people's fears sort of kick in when, um, when they hear that there's going to be, you know, a reinvention. Um, but actually, you know, much of, the, much of our version of the Nutcracker story is still kind of based and structured the same way that a traditional Nutcracker um, it, it is structured mostly because of the music, because the music really dictates the action, and you know it's it's wonderful storytelling music. It's um, uh, and and I think of all the Tchaikovsky scores, it's kind of the leanest, um, and uh, and really uh, presents some of the most beautiful melodies that he ever wrote. Um, so, the I suppose the major difference um, of our production is the setting. Um, the fact that we decided to make uh, our protagonist uh, a little girl, the daughter of um, immigrant workers working on the construction of the World's Fair, um, a, actually a single parent family. Um, we're not too sure what happened to father. That's sort of left to the imagination. Um, and, uh, and make our version of the story about uh, community, as well as family, of course, community, um, a community of people who come together who have very little but who create magic and so the magic then uh, is born from this quite creative group of people in, in a sense and, and overseen by a Drosselmeyer-like character, we call him the great impresario, who is, um, I suppose you could liken him to a kind of Daniel Burnham. I keep saying, you know, Daniel Burnham, Tesla, P.T. Barnum, kind of a showman of, of that, you know, of that time. Um, and uh, so he comes to this worker's hut on Christmas Eve to reward his workers who are building this magnificent, magnificent fairground um, for, for him and, and for the world. Uh, so I suppose that's prob probably the largest innovation is that it's not about a wealthy Victorian child who grows up in, in, and has this, the, this privileged lifestyle and, um, and a, a wonderful Christmas Eve party and then she falls asleep and dreams of more goodies. Um, this is a, a child who is missing something 
that's very important to a child missing a, a parent and um, who is, a, 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 you know, a member of this community. Um, and so her journey, she's rewarded at the end of this journey with more than just candy. Let's, let's leave it that, at that for now without giving too much away. Mm -hmm. And I really think that this World's Fair conceit is pretty genius because it allows them to logically proceed with the divertissement in the second act. And there are still going to be, there are going to be Chinese dragons. There will not be any Russian dancers, um, but there will be Buffalo Bill Cody, uh, wild, a Wild West show, which actually happened on the outskirts of the fair. It was yeah. like the fringe festival yeah. of the World's Fair. <laughs> they, they didn't let him in, actually. He wasn't, uh, for some reason, he wasn't licensed to perform on the fairground. He wasn't part of the selection. And so, um, sort of in protest, he set up right outside the fairground gates and, you know, took a lot of the... Um, not that the, the, the fair was suffering for numbers of people, but I think, uh, you know, his, his show did very well um, because many of the people that came out and went into the fair went to see his show as well. And I, but I am curious exactly where the idea came from to use the World's Fair. It does make sense. I, this morning I happened to meet uh, Dylan, who is playing Fritz in Act One. Um, he is a, he's a Chicago area young dancer, and he told me that he actually studied the World's Fair in fourth grade. However, he doesn't remember because that was a long time ago and he's now in seventh grade. <laughs> <laughs> that so, is really sweet. Yes. So kids in Chicago uh. do still have a little bit of a concept of the World's Fair, but um, you know, what, how did you hone in on that idea and what do you think people in Chicago or the rest of the Midwest know about the World's Fair? Well, I think most people probably know about the World's Fair from the Eric Larson novel, Devil in the White City, which was hugely, you know, I think that took, took the subject of the World's Fair out into the world. Um, certainly how I, I, mean, I'm, I was aware that there had been a World's Fair in Chicago, but I learned so much about, you know, the, 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 the pulling all of the elements together. It feels a little, like, a little like pulling all the elements of a nutcracker together, actually. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, and the, the politics that were involved and, of course, you know, the serial killer that we've kept out of this production of The Nutcracker. No serial killer in, in this one. Um, but, you know, I can't take credit for the idea uh, initially. Um, it was actually, you know, Ashley, um, when he came to me and when we started discussing uh, A Nutcracker for Joffrey Ballet, he really wanted a production that was specifically made for the Joffrey and for the city of Chicago. And so, you know, hit, so the World's Fair idea really started with Ash. Um, so maybe you want to have him answer that question. So I think, uh, good evening, everyone. I think that when I uh, um, was appointed the director of the Joffrey Ballet in 2007, um, I was still working at San Francisco Ballet, but I was also working with Christopher in New York with his own company, Morphosis. And, and as I kind of got to know Chicago and the wonderful people of Chicago and a city that is steeped in incredible history, um, it has suffered great disasters but also great successes. And so on top of the, the, there was the disaster of the fire of Chicago, which kind of wiped the city out, and then the rebuilding, and then the World's Fair came right on top of that. And it, it kind of galvanized the city and became a really uh, focal point for the city and it attracted millions and millions of people to Chicago. And I think that you know, many of us know that the electric light bulb was kind of debuted at the World's Fair, the Ferris wheel. There were so many things that came out of that fair. So the more I read about it and thinking about this idea that Chris and I had had over a lunch in New York about um, he'd never done a nutcracker, and I knew that as much as I loved Robert Joffrey's Nutcracker, um, it was completely falling apart and we had to do something. So were we gonna rebuild it and keep it the same or were we going to take this opportunity to have one of the best living, breathing choreographers in the world today come and work with the Joffrey and kind of reimagine what the Nutcracker looks like. So the World's Fair for me just seemed an amazing journey for a country that is made up of immigrants we all come from somewhere. Um, I think that the values of the Nutcracker are in our humanity, not in gifts. And I think that to re-look at, at what family means and what community means and how we celebrate that in a really magical way just seemed, it just seemed the right place. And, and for Marie, 
to be able to travel through the World's Fair and to um, explore the pavilions that were built at the World's Fair. Um, it just uh, just had a, it had a continuing journey. And then one of the things that Julian has done is picked up on certain icons, if you will, of the fair, some of which you may need to Wikipedia. I know I did. Um, but you had a chance to pick and choose what it is that you wanted to have in the background. For example, um, there's even a palm tree. And I was sort of like, why is there a palm tree as I was watching rehearsal? But there's a reason. So would you talk a little bit about how you picked and chose the images? Well, I mean, to be honest, we had a a lot to pick from. Mm -hmm. it, it, actually, it actually is not hard in a way. It is, there was so much there. Um, I think the, in terms of, uh, I mean, to be honest, I'm, I'm mostly trying to pick Chris's brain. And, and, and mostly I think design is a kind of f fortune telling where, you know, you're trying to, you know, I did the design for this over a year ago. And you're trying, and you're imagining what it's going to be like to be right here now, where we are, putting this together. So, so mostly though, I'm trying to pick Chris's brain for and and deliver the vision he wants. Then within that, I could think I get to play around a little bit when he's not looking. <laughs> <laughs> and that I think though, you know, even though you're, you know. It, Julian is an excellent designer, but I think that partly maybe speaks to Chris's ability to pick collaborators who you can work with so well. And you tend to see one of the things I one of what I think your strengths are as a choreographer, or what you see you need help with, and identifying the people who can help you forward the entire story. And if you look back at some of Chris's other full-length ballets, um, you worked with Nicholas Wright on Alice in Wonderland, who's a British playwright. And for Winter's Tale, you actually had a, um, has help from Nicholas, I always mispronounce his name, Nicholas Heitner, yes, right, who has been director of the National Theater. And, and I just wrote about this for the Washington Post recently, and I got to you know, talk to Chris, talk to Nick, and I thought, how cool is this, that a choreographer and a great British theater direct, uh, director walked into a bar and started talking about Shakespeare. Well. <laughs> That sounds like a great high-low culture mix. Then very recently, I have to admit that I was, you know, having a girls' night with a friend. There may have been a bottle of wine involved, and we decided to watch Center Stage. That's how you know Nicholas Heitner, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yes. It is. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. We have a few Center Stage fans <laughs> over here. But, okay, so getting, if you could talk a little bit about your collaborative process, and we also have involved here with this Nutcracker the children's book writer, Brian O'Selznick, who um, is probably best known for the book that became the movie Hugo. And um, Basil Twist, the puppeteer, who I just can't wait to see what he's done with the Christmas tree. So maybe talk a little bit about a little bit more about the collaborative process and how you chose the rest of the team for the Nutcracker. Well, I believe that you know that the ballet can be um, you, there. There are places for all types of ballet. There are there are you know it's. It, I still love working in the abstract. I still love the simplicity of the leotard and an empty stage and and. Um, you know, dance as the sort of the primary focus. But I think with, with a story ballet like The Nutcracker, um, maybe more so The Nutcracker than any of the story ballets that, that, I've, um, that I've worked on so far, um, I believe in dynamic theater and um, that all of the elements uh, need to sort of marry together to, to make a, an exciting theatrical event. Um, Sometimes ballet productions get sort of a bad rap and, and people think, you know, that they're, they're sort of a bit kind of staid and old fashioned. And, um, and so, you know, I, I'm keen on, on, um, on working with great people like Julian and Basil and Natasha Katz, the lighting designer, and 59 Productions, our projection designers, to take audiences on a real journey. Um, of course, dance is the language, is the primary storytelling language, but um, sometimes, you know, sometimes that needs a little bit of help. And so when you have great people around you, um, again, and, and, and as you said, understanding what it is you do well and what you might need a little bit of help with, um, perhaps uh, sometimes stories, the stories become a little kind of blurry um, and are, are difficult to follow. 
Um, and the Nutcracker, we have such a responsibility with the Nutcracker because the Nutcracker is, um, is going to be sort of the, many children's first theatrical experience, first time going to the theatre. Um, it's sort of a gateway to what we hope will be an audience of the future. Um, everybody remembers their first Nutcracker. And uh, so if it can be a dynamic, exciting experience, then, um, you know, then, then there's, there's hope to sort of build, uh, build uh, audiences for other productions of the, of the ballet in, in the future. Yeah. Uh, maybe Ashley and April can talk a little bit about how that building, you know, was distinct working with Christopher here. Now, you've also done Christopher Swan Lake, but this is your first, and then um, obviously there's some other, though there's more abstract ballets that are in the company's repertoire, but a little bit about what that process was been like, especially in the studio. And I know, April, I've heard that Christopher likes to demonstrate quite a bit, and perhaps more than oh, some choreographers. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's been an amazing experience so far. We have been fortunate to dance um, a number of Chris's ballets, I, th I believe like seven over the last eight years. So we've developed a relationship with, us, with him, and he's really gotten to know the company. So I think with that base already coming in to do this brand new production, um, we knew each other on a different level. So it wasn't just kind of meeting the dancers and see what we can do. He saw what we were capable of doing. So I feel like working with him in the studio, he really um, pushes us to our limits. I feel like I was sitting in the house watching rehearsals and talking with some dancers about how amazing our fellow dancers look and that they're dancing better than ever. And I think a large part of that is because Chris knows what we're capable of doing. And even in the beginning, I remember working on um, what is the sugar plum variation and some of the steps he was doing. It's very intricate footwork and thinking like, this is never going to happen. I can't get this. And he's like, you'll get it. You'll get it. Keep working it. And now here we are getting ready to perform. And it's like, yes, it's possible. And he knew it and it's happening. And, and I think that's really incredible. And um, Yes, he does like to demonstrate and get into character and show us, but he's a great coach too. You know, he'll see us and be like, that's not quite right. And he knows how to direct everybody. He sees we all work differently. We're, we don't react the same way. And so he really knows how to look at you and see um, how to get the best kind of like acting and dancing out of the dancers. So it's really special. And I would say that, um, you know, I've, I've been a huge, huge fan of Chris's work ever since um, he started choreographing New York City Ballet. And then I had the opportunity in San Francisco to work with him on quite a few creations. And I, so when I took over the Joffrey, um, Chicago had not really seen a lot of Chris's work. And so, you know, I felt that I wanted to give our audience access to his work. So we, I remember we opened with Carousel, a dance, which was just a phenomenal uh, invitation for the audience to kind of have access to what Chris was capable of. And over the years, we've done more and more, both abstract and narrative. Uh, Swan Lake, which we pr presented uh, two years ago, um, has been the greatest success for the Joffrey Ballet. And I think that a, lot of, a lot of people thought the Joffrey Ballet and Swan Lake would never, ever, ever go together. But I think that, that how Christopher sees a narrative and how he puts that narrative into the language of ballet is a really beautiful thing that, that all of us understand. And so it's been an amazing journey for not only the company, but also for our audience. And I think that for all of you here to see what he has created for the Nutcracker, is a, it's really a gift. Um, I'd like that, you know, April mentioned acting just a bit and for, you know, as um, Chuck mentioned, you know, Christopher got sort of, even though we, uh, those of us in the ballet world know he's a big deal, we had to share him um, with American in Paris. And I'm really curious what sort of tools of the trade and tricks and conventions you've carried over from the theatrical world, cause, which you've mentioned, and Julian, um, have now come into the ballet world that maybe would not have otherwise been part of the production or would have been a ch an addition to the process. And I think we're seeing it here, even though the last Nutcracker got to try out at Hampshire, this is like an out of town tryout is what we call it in the theater world. So what has, you know, what did you learn from that experience that's now you're doing differently in the creation of this full length work? I suppose in a way, you know, what's interesting about working in theater and working with actors is actors 
Um, actors can't move from A to B without knowing why they have to do that. And that can sometimes be incredibly infuriating, but actually more, more than that on a higher level, it's, it's really interesting because, um, because it forces you as a director to really think through every moment and really be focusing on not just what's happening in the center, but also what's happening sort of on, on the, you know, on the, the periphery. Um, and sometimes again, ballet tends to, uh, we sort of sometimes brush that aside. Like if you're a peasant number four in Giselle, you're kind of standing at the side with your hands on your hips. And it doesn't really matter what you're doing as long as every now and then you lift an arm, you know? <laughs> and so, um, so what I'm trying to encourage the dancers and the kids as well, it's, it's great working with the kids and trying to, trying to give every individual on the stage a purpose, whether they're, you know, just a parent in the party scene, give everyone a character um, and encourage everyone to understand, you know, where they've come from or think for themselves because, you know, when you've got a cast the size of the Nutcracker, you can't go around and write an individual synopsis for each dancer, but encourage them to know when they come into the Christmas party where they've come from, what their situation is at home and where they're going when they leave the scene. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I think, is, has definitely... Um, having that experience on Broadway has, has definitely sort of influenced the way that I encourage the dancers to um, to really develop uh, a character for themselves, and because every single person on that stage contributes to the the journey that the audience is experiencing. So if you're you know sitting over on a chair behind the table and just you know just decorating the set as it were, then um, you know some of that some of that texture, some of that atmosphere gets lost. Um, so I suppose that, that's been you know, the, the, the biggest change for me. And I think that that could be even reflected in the dancers. I know I've talked to Robbie Fairchild, who was your Tony nominee lead, and he said he'll never look at an entrance the same way. You know that in ballet we think of, oh, the prince comes out and you know, puts a hand on his hip and he's ready to go, and that he'll never walk out on stage the same way. Um, April, can you? Mm. Um, share any character background of, and, and then in the first act, we should add that you are sort of the mother character, mm -hmm. and then there'll be a carryover and a sort of dream sequence version of your character in the second act, and share what you want and what have you thought, you know, at what in terms of your development of the character. How much am I at liberty to say? Oh. Should go, I, go should for I, it. I mean, so I don't, I don't know. I don't want to give it away because it's so beautiful, and I want you to all to have the same surprise I had, like when Chris said it, and I was like, oh, I just got goosebumps imagining it. There's some really beautiful moments, don't but give it all away. I know I'm not going to. Just not the end. But but look, guys, casting is they up and on the internet, so anyone can see the list of characters. Okay, okay, right? Right? So that's, okay. okay, great. So yes, in this version, um, so the sugar plum is called the golden statue. And this, that's the Sugar Plum Fairy. And she is the mother in the first act. So, um, and I love, I, I don't know if it's later in my career, but roles that have a lot more depth and artistry that you can, it's not just getting on stage and smiling or having, but you know, when you can really get into a role is really special. And um, so I think being, being involved from the beginning, from act one and coming out in the first scene, you, um, you're part of the Nutcracker from the very beginning and you get to develop the role. And I think um, when Marie starts her journey into the second act and she discovers the golden statue and sees like a similarity there and feels something, wait, I know her, I've seen her before. And I think there's these really special connections between um, in the story, there's little, you'll, you'll, oh God, I don't want to give it away. <laughs> I don't know how to say. Um, I, I don't know. There's a lot. There's a lot to sink your teeth into. Like there, it's not just like I'm the sugar plum fairy and my tiara and my pink tutu and this is my magical land, which is glorious and I love and I think that that's Nutcracker also and so special. But this is similar but completely different and it just has so many more levels from the very beginning and I think that's been really fun. That on top of just the dancing, there's a lot of depth to all of the characters and it's fun. I think also that, you know, when we did Swan Lake and, and Chris came to Chicago and we worked really hard on Swan Lake, and then when he left, he wrote to the company and said, you know, find purpose 
in every single thought, in every gesture, in, er in the way you dance, and what does it mean to do these different roles within a, within a work. And that if you find that intention, you're, everything, as Chris was saying, everything then is, is a complete picture. And you've got a company that is moving in all in the same direction, which I think is kind of uh, imperative if we're going to really succeed in our art form. Let me say, can I add a little something to Please. what's really special is that we've done a lot of his works that have already been created on other companies, and then they're set on us, and so we're dancing already made roles. So this is special because he created it on us. So in the creative process, like, it, there's a lot of back and forth. Um, so if something doesn't feel right, or he'll look and he'll say, how did that feel? Did that feel good? Or how can we make that better? How can we make that more natural for you? And I think having that makes us much more unique to the Joffrey because all of the roles were created on us. So it's, it's a different, it's got a different feel too. There were, there were some classic moments where I would go into rehearsal with um, the five ladies that are learning the golden statue. And every day we were in the same studio, sort of on on the on the um, backside of the of the um, uh, of the studio complex. And I'd walk in, and they they all kind of had their own space in the room. They're very respectful of one another. It's not like get out of my way, you know. <laughs> I, I'm I'm the first cast. They're all very respectful, and so they would sort of they lined themselves up equally spaced, all five of them across the back of the studio, and then they would they would carve out their own space to dance the solo, which of course doesn't really work because um, you need to cover all of the space to, you know, to, to really understand how the, how the, the movement's going to work in, in, in a bigger space. But um, there'd be moments where I would be facing the mirror and there'd be this wall of, you know, gorgeous ballerinas behind me and I'd show a step and they'd just, if they liked the step, you could tell because they'd practice it. And if, they, if there was a step that they didn't think was going to look good on them or work, quite frankly, they'd just stand there. And you could just... <laughs> I don't know what you're talking so about. So you could just kind of... You could just kind of feel it. And use the back of your... Like, the hairs on the back of your neck bristle a little bit. And so then I would turn and I'd be like, is anyone going to try it? And of course, someone would valiantly try it. And, um, and it doesn't... Like April was saying, you know, my movement is... Um, it's not straightforward. It's often off kilter. Um, I am often asking for them to um, contract in ways that you know uh, makes the point work really challenging. It's not just straight up and down. Um, I like expansive movement, and sometimes that's a little bit scary when you're still trying to figure it out. Um, so it, it's very much a process. And you know, then I went away for a few weeks, and I came back, and they were already starting to starting to look much better on their bodies and. Um, so it's all, it's all a process, but, uh, but these guys are lovely to work with. They're very collaborative and, um, and it's also, you know, it's also, it's also fun in the studio. You know, we had a, we have a good time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we're going to open the floor for audience questions, but I was wondering if first Ashley would be willing to share a memory or two from, uh, the performances here in the creation of the first Nutcracker. Absolutely. I have to say that, because I, uh, I wanted to uh, respond to Chuck as well, that the relationship between the Joffrey Ballet and, and, and Hancha and, and the University of Iowa is really uh, a quite extraordinary, unique opportunity for, for all of us. And, and my, it feels like coming home here, because I've danced here so many times. Um, I won't get to dance at this beautiful theater that you've built, um, but I have many, many great memories of Hancha. Uh, and, uh, and so I remember that first night when we presented Robert Joffrey's Nutcracker, and it was a really huge deal. The Joffrey had never done a Nutcracker. Joffrey knew that it was essential that we had one. And even though the process was, was very difficult because Ro Robert Joffrey was not so well at that time, so we never got to see enough of him. But, but the response from the people of Iowa and from all the people that have supported Hancha, that have supported the Joffrey over all these years, is really an amazing feeling. And when you have that support behind you, it's just you're, you're, you're a team. Like, we're all a team here. So we want, we, all we want is success. And we want to engage, and we want to make sure that we have a future generation that loves the art form as much as we do. So that opening night was um, really, really a, a magical moment. And I can promise you something on Thursday night, too. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, do we have any questions from out here? And I'll repeat, if you want to say your question, then as long as I've got it, I'll repeat it for everyone, make sure everyone else has heard. Okay. Yes. First of all, thank you for bringing this to, to the community and, and for the opportunity for the youth of our community to take. Can you talk a little bit about putting the production together, rehearsing kids here for several weeks leading up to, and of course the company moved to Chicago, and how it's all come together over the last week or so? Yeah, it's actually um, one of the most challenging uh, rehearsal processes I've had so far because. You know, it's already challenging having a large number of kids in, in the work. Um, you know, we have to work around, obviously, the school hours, and, um, and everything takes longer. It's great fun, but uh, when you're working and you're trying to create something that's perhaps a little bit, bit more complex than a straightforward nutcracker, um, uh, it, it, it can be very tiring because we, you know, we have our, our kids' rehearsals in the evening after a six-hour day rehearsing with the company. And, um, but, but there's also something really fantastic about seeing everything start to click for them and to, to see them start to invent for themselves. Um, we worked with the Chicago kids, I mean, on and off since the beginning of August. So coming up here and um, uh, the, the group that have been working up here, the, the ballet master that's been working with them up here from uh, from Joffrey and also the, the, the local um, ballet masters have done a f really fantastic job. I was very nervous because um, I didn't really know what to expect. We've got very little time. They've just had to kind of had to uh, uh, be sort of plugged into the production in a way. Um, and so I'm seeing them for the first time um, along with I'm seeing the theatre for the first time and the production for the first time, the scenery, the costumes, the lighting. Um, so it's uh, it's been a huge relief to 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 have this this great group of kids. And of course, we're pushing them every day, and they're going to get better. And there's still a lot of work to do. But um, and then as far as the rest of the production is concerned, uh, I said to the company a couple of days ago over the mic. Um, because I, I can't, you, you kind of feel everybody getting fearful at this stage because the pressure's on. Um, and even though these are previews, of course, we want to deliver something as marvelous as what we're going to be delivering in Chicago. We want to create something really great for you guys. So, um, yes, it's previews, but it's really opening. Um, and uh, so people get nervous, there's tension, and so I said to the company, look, just remember, because many of them haven't been through this process before, uh, on this scale anyway, um, and I have, so I've had a little bit of experience, and just to remember that it's going to be chaos right up until the opening. Um, uh, all of these elements sort of crashing together, tumbling together at the same time, um, creates a lot of, a lot of chaos. And, and you know, eventually that that chaos sort of subsides, and something really beautiful happens. And you know, maybe it's not absolutely right the first time round. Um, maybe there are things that we will work on between um, between our opening here on Thursday and Chicago, and then again between this year and next year. Um, I've been working on Winter's Tale for a couple of years. I've been working on. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, I still go in there and tweak. So, you know, that's one of the joys of having a recurring production. You can make it better and, and make improvements. But um, I suppose the short answer to this question is we are still living in chaos. <laughs> <laughs> but we shall emerge. We shall emerge. And I did, I was able to, at the rehearsal I saw yesterday, um, see some of these, the local kids in action. And, and Christopher does a great job of giving them notes. Um, you told, the one uh, child did not get off stage quite quick enough, and you told her to, I believe, skedaddle. Skedaddle, uh, yes. Yes, skedaddle, yeah. yes. Yeah. So <laughs> you know, there is, all the children are being very well treated. Um, no, no wrath of the angry choreographer. So. Anyone else? OK, thank you. Yeah, I'll try and speak properly into my microphone. Um, well, um, I did Cinderella with Chris. I, was that how three years ago, four years ago? Four years ago. Four yeah. years ago. Yeah. And actually, very soon after that, I was very flattered that he he talked about this. So it was a long time coming. And we I don't think we did anything for two years, but I started buying 
the books uh, about the about the World's Fair. And I suppose the starting place for me usually is like a massive amount of picture research, which is part work and part putting it off. You know, it's... Um, uh, and it used to be in libraries and now it's on the internet and, you know. So, so for me, I start looking at pictures and I can't... And I'll collect a huge amount. I'm looking for things that kind of flirt with me in some way. I don't always know why. Some of it's very... Some of it's very obvious, or so pictures of the World Fair, and then there's other things where you just think, well, I'm intrigued by this image. So that's how I start. Um, and then it obviously shifts into a different gear when, when Chris and I work together, and that's when I was talking about trying to read his mind and trying to find out where he is. I think, I think one thing that was very obvious to me very early on was that the Chicago World's Fair was, was called the White City, and that white isn't quite enough for the whole of a nutcracker. So I think what, what happens, and this happens, I think, whenever you do something that involves realism and historical research, you have to kind of find where that meets theatricality and fantasy, and there's, especially this ballet, more than anything else, because I think we... We really, we wanted to deliver what everyone would want, but not necessarily in exactly the same way. Um, so I suppose the process then is kind of weighing up this research with 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 a, the, what you sort of dream of doing that's not necessarily in the research. So I, I suppose that's the next stage. I'm um, I'm oh, a little scared of costume design, and Chris. Well, the two times I worked with Chris, he's asked me to, but I feel like a little bit of a novice with that. I feel I can draw a costume and know what it should look like, but oh, I don't do it a huge amount, and ballet is a really, really technical area, so I left that on the back burner as long as possible and <laughs> stuck to my comfort zone. Um, I, st I started... I, I didn't train in the theatre, so I started um, in theatre really as a mask maker. As a kid, I would make masks... And I think that's one reason why Chris came to me. Um, so I, I definitely was thinking a little bit about that. And um, it's, it's hard to say because I, I think really it's just like a big web of overlapping things and then my ideas and Chris's ideas. And then um, I think I, I actually, I knew Brian Selznick, so I th guess that was one thing that I brought that, people wouldn't expect that to come through the design in a way and then I got scared because Brown I don't know if people know Brown Selznick but he's like a graphic artist and fantastic and then I thought oh no I brought someone in who can draw better than me <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was part that was part of the process um, uh, yeah um, so and, and really it's just um, just like a very long cooking of different ingredients and you know at certain points you sort of discover you're going down the wrong path and you need to shift and change um it's just just like anything anything else in life and i think that maybe if i can just speaking of cinderella there's a gorgeous carryover between the sets and the costumes that hopefully we'll see in the Nutcracker too. So even though it may be, you know, yeah, maybe no, you a good felt reason. under There's your a very good side. reason for having the same yeah. scene design, costume design. But what, what I need actually, and what, which I've had is, I need fantastic assistance, which fortunately the Joffrey has supplied. So, you know, I get a lot of help. I get a lot of help from these guys as well, because of course they they wear, they've worn these clothes you know, they've worn clothes to be danced in, and so they know far more than I do. So I get a lot of support in order to do that. Yeah. And April gets a, a great reveal moment to reveal some of those clothes, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, other questions? Thank you. Yes. How long do you suspect that the new Nutcracker will remain relevant? 
I mean, I think the, the thing with, um, with the old production is that it got to the point where the scenery was that so much paint had come off the drops. I mean, we were asking the lighting designer to really be a magician. And the wood was rotten. And so it was actually not very safe. And the clothes were, <coughs> they were in rags. I mean, even last year, a little girl, I said, oh, how are you? And she said, you know, she said, I am wearing rags. She said, my costume <laughs> has so many holes in it. So, um, so it was just time to really say it had done a fantastic job. And uh, we have not got rid of the production. I think that um, because of Kermit Love, and he was so involved in that production, especially the Mother Ginger and the Mice Heads, um, that the Chicago History Museum is interested in preserving some of, the, some of it. And also, um, the design was by, the costume design was by John David Ridge, who had been head of um, Holston Couture for years and years and years. So there are, there are some of the original costumes that, are, that yeah, as tatty as they are, have been preserved. They haven't been worn for years. Um, so I'm hoping that this production lasts another 29 years. Let's shoot for 30. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question, thank you. Uh, one or two more, maybe? Or should we end on, okay, thank you. I know we don't have a lot of clips here, but I'm hoping maybe some of them would be willing to speak a little bit to the puppetry and how that came to be and, and how that fits in the story. I, Basil was with um, uh, Chris and I, um, uh, when we did Cinderella. So in some ways, he's part of that kind of team. Um, it, for me, it, it's strange, because I, I do puppetry, but um, but I, doing set and costume, just there's just no way I could do that element as well. So and I've, so I work with Basil's my go-to guy for that. And he can definitely do things that I can't do. He's fantastic with fabric and... and um, He's funny, I mean, Basil, because he's, he brings a real different energy, doesn't he? He's, he sort of scrabbles around and he pulls things together and he, um, he's incredibly hands-on and he, bring, he brings a different personality yeah. into the mix. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I just, I've heard, been a huge fan of Basil's work and really, really wanted to work with him. And so when he, when he said yes to Cinderella, I was thrilled. And he, um, he only did one thing on Cinderella. He created the most m miraculous coach it's a, a, an absolutely he did the tree well. he did he did the he yeah. did the, do the tree and actually we discovered um, in in Cinderella really because of poor workmanship when <laughs> from the scenic shop uh, the tree you know we got the tree to the stage the first day and it really did not look good it's it kind of look, looked a little bit like a kindergarten project and um, we were in a bit of a panic because we were relying on this tree to not only look magnificent but also do quite a few basil design this sort of rope pulley system so that, that the branches of the tree would come down and then they would reveal a character and then they would go away um, so not only did the tree not look good it didn't work the pulley system that they'd rigged just didn't it wasn't uh, um, to his desi design specifications and they couldn't figure out a way to make it work so we were in a bit of a state and um, kind of as a last resort, uh, the projection designer that we were working with on that production said, well, you know, let me photograph the tree and uh, manipulate the images and we'll project it back onto itself. Um, and the results are absolutely spectacular. And, and I think actually that moment for me was, uh, was, was quite sort of transformative in the way that I like to, to see stage design and the, how the combination of projection used um, with, with paint, with, you know, kind of traditional painted scenery. Um, I don't think projection works very well on its own. I don't think projection works very well when you're competing with uh, live action because our eyes now are so attuned to screens and moving image that you'll always go to the moving image before you'll go to the live action. But the right combination, a sort of a marriage, a blending of traditional scenery and subtle projection, um, painterly projection, is um, something quite extraordinary. So uh, I've deviated. Anyway, Basil. Uh, <laughs> so the Nutcracker 
seemed it just seemed such an obvious uh, collaboration. There's there are so many kind of um, uh, magnificent opportunities for um, for for puppetry stagecraft in the show. The, you know there are mice, and of course the children play the mice as well. But uh, we've got some f fantastic mice, rats. I should call them rats because they they really are rats. Um, and um, the tree, of course, the <coughs> magical growing Christmas tree. Um, there's a journey at the beginning of Act Two. So Basil is he's a, he's a genius with silk. So we've got some lovely silk work. Uh, so ag again, it sort of ties into the idea of a re re really dynamic theatrical experience and bringing all of these incredible people together um, and then bossing them around. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, ba Basil also, he took a bit of persuading on this job because he got uh, one of those MacArthur Genius Grants and, and, he, and actually he's now designing his own ballet for... Where's he uh, doing that for? Uh, in Columbus, actually, for yeah. um, Ballet Met. Yeah. So he took a little bit of... We had to net him in for this one. <laughs> but he's uh, probably still down there working. Yeah. And I think also, like, for, because the company had never worked with Basil, um, and we workshopped for a couple of weeks with Basil, and so they learned how... How do you make a rat look amazingly realistic? And how do you make a water um, ripple? And so I think that you know, it's another dimension to our lives as artists, that we're not just about ballet, dancing the steps, but actually about being part of theater. Mm -hmm. And Basil's very much part of theater. So it's, Those were some interesting afternoons too, because Basil is, as Julian said, he's very hands-on and he's very, I mean, he can make something out of anything. He could make this water bottle into some, something beautiful. Um, but, you know, and when you're not, when you're group with a group of people, people like dancers who don't have this experience very often, um, uh, and so we'd have these three-hour blocks in the afternoons where the entire company were called and they'd sit there and Basil would be, you know, just having this incredible uh, relationship with, you know, a stuffed sock. And, um, <laughs> and everybody kind of, and, and actually getting everybody on board with that and helping them to understand that, no, this man is going to make something truly magical, but you have to believe, you know, you have to go on this journey. You know, we tied two tables together and Basil went off for an hour and cut out the sort of the outline of a, of a boat. And then ma with masking tape, he, he strapped the, you know, the cardboard onto the, and, uh, and so, you know, you have to, you, it's, it, it, you have to have a sort of a, a, a leap of faith and, 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 and an imagination to, to be able to under truly understand what it is um, that he's coming up with. But now the dancers can see yeah. what it is he's come Beyond. up with. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's good for all of us to have that experience and yeah. to be with someone so childlike and so imaginative. Um, you know, food for the soul. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right. <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have a lot of a lot of British accents up here, and then it's, I kind of love in the theater. If you are around the theater and you hear one of these, Ashley or Chris or Julian didn't seem to be mic'd yesterday, but you're definitely convinced that God has a British accent <laughs> from all like this, you know, the booming voices um, for rehearsals. Um, maybe one more question, and then we'll, or we can end on. Right. Well, we can end on your rumination on Basil Twist, who is, I guess, not present to um, hear his, his work praised. But he is going to be speaking later this week, along with Brian Oselznik, to, to some of the dancers and creatives involved. Can, um, can we just, just one more thing before we finish? Because I think it's really important that when you're spending millions of dollars on a new production, and it's so complicated, and... And so time for us is the most valuable thing in the world. And having these three weeks here at Hancha to really get this production together has been phenomenal. So I just want to say on behalf of the Joffrey Ballet that Hancha and the university believing in the Joffrey, supporting us, and giving us time, thank you. Yeah. Can I get that